Now we are in this absolutely splendid venue of the DNA, the home, which many regard, of craft. As Heritage Crafts Association, what we feel we do is to add more to the DNA because we are concerned not simply with the artifacts that surround us here in these wonderful exhibitions of the best of British craft and craft from abroad, not just with the artifacts, but also, and importantly, with the skills and the techniques and the imagination that is needed to create those artifacts, the intangible cultural heritage that we have. It's a very special day for us in Heritage Craft because this is the first time that we've had an opportunity for all of our friends, our members, to get together. So a very warm welcome to all of you who have signed up to be friends and who support us. Now, I did most of the ticketing, so I know that there are some people in the room who are not signed up yet. <laughs> well, we hope by the end of the day you will see what a splendid organisation we are, that we are the umbrella organisation that represents 80% plus of the crafts that are not considered to be innovative and cutting-edge contemporary crafts, which are covered by the Crafts Council. And it's only by your support that we can do what we do. And when Robin tells you some of the things that we've been doing, I hope that this will convince you. It costs 12 quid a year. That's the price of, you know, how many few cups of coffee from Costa Coffee or whatever. It's a very insignificant amount, but it is by your support that we can continue to do what we do. And I hope that at the end of today, you'll all be our ambassadors. Um, in fact, Robin and I were coming back from the meeting, a series of meetings on Wednesday, and we think we might have signed up two people on the underground. This is what we need to do. Uh, this is one of those days when it is a celebration of everything to do with craft, and people who are passionate about craft. I know that in the room today there are many people who are professionals, who are full-time craftspeople. And so you, like me, will be in a situation, no doubt, I am a scribe, illuminator, and designer, where people say, how many hours a week do you work then? And I say, I really don't know. Because for me there is no <coughs> distinction between work and non-work, between work and pleasure. I love what I do, and I do it all the time. And so for me, it isn't considered to be work. In 1918, the great letter cutter, type designer, sculptor, bit of a dodgy personal life, but you won't go there, Eric Gill, wrote, that state is a state of slavery, where a man does what he likes to do in his own time, and in his working time, that which is required of him. But how marvellous for those of us who are interested in craft to be able to do what we love doing so much of the time. And in fact, one of our patrons and a speaker later this morning, Alex Langlands, wrote on the subject of craft and the importance of craft that I just wish we could get carved in stone and put side, outside all those buildings of people who make decisions. And he said, craft should be about pleasure and therapy as well. There are few that doubt the value and worth of a creative element to anyone's day. And the ritual use of hands and mind in the formation of both a functional and beautiful object can serve only to relax the mind and improve the body. Now this is what we need to do to get craft back into schools and to get craft courses back into training. So today is a day about celebration and passion and there are few people who are more passionate about crafts than our chair, Robin Wood. Many of you will know that he is a consummate craftsman, turning the most beautiful objects in wood using a foot-powered lathe. I first met Robin two years ago when we set up the Heritage Crafts Association. We had an initial meeting to say, well, is there a need for this? Are we just wasting our time? Is there a purpose? And once we had sorted out the things that we thought were the most important, our aims, objectives, what we wanted to do, and so on, we then came to the thorny issue of who was going to do what. Now those of you who have served on committees will recognise this moment because it's the moment where certain people become really interested <laughs> in that dot on the floor. And they carry on looking there until all the jobs have been allocated 
And then they come back to the committee meeting again. Well, it wasn't quite like that. Heritage Crafts is a group that I've been involved in that is unlike almost any other group. Because without a doubt and with one voice, we knew that Robin was the ideal person to be our chair. It is both the breadth and the depth of the knowledge that he has. And I can give you an example of this, in that we saw John Hayes, the Minister for Business and Skills this week, we virtually sat on our chairs when he threw a googly. So what's the state with reed thatching now? Are there anybody, is anybody doing reed thatching? One, five, ten? Without blinking an eyelid and a straight back, 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 bat, back, got it. I have a cricketing husband, so I have these cricketing analogies all the time. I have no idea what they mean. <laughs> um, he said, this is the state of reed thatches, and this is the state of straw, straw thatches. Well, I didn't even know there was a difference. So this is the person that we had leading us, and I'm convinced that it is because of Robin and the way in which he leads us as a team that we've made as much progress as we have in the few years that we have been running Heritage Crafts Association. So he's going to tell us a little bit more about the association now.
tends to be the way that heritage has been viewed in, in England um, is as buildings and monuments rather than the living heritage of, of craft skills. Um, I'm also quite interested, I, I've worked alongside many rural people like Owen, but I'm also very interested in um, town-based industrial crafts. And this is an area which is probably even more under the radar than the, the rural crafts are. Um, this is Ernest Wrightenson's Scissor Makers in Sheffield, where there are, there are three guys left there, all over 65, making scissors. Um, still going into work just because they love making scissors and they make the most beautiful beautiful scissors too, um, but all over 65 um, and a potentially dying crap. This is Trevor Ablett, also in Sheffield, making simple working pocket knives. Uh, he's 70, one of the younger pocket knife makers in Sheffield, <laughs> and, uh, and he still turns out 100 pocket knives a week. Simple working pocket knives, beautiful things. Um, so there, that to me is a part of the cultural heritage of Sheffield. But Sheffield Council have a culture plan which doesn't mention either steel or cutlery, which to my mind is a bit like Stratford, only a culture plan that doesn't mention Shakespeare. Um, quite incredible. But that shows where we are. Um, now this is coming forward to, uh, this, this photo was taken two years ago, um, and it was really the start of the, the Heritage Crafts Association. Uh, on the right there is Brian Crossley, who's here today. He's the uh, secretary of the association um, and has long been involved in, in the Basket Makers Association. Uh, and I met with Brian on this day two years ago with, with the idea of setting up a traditional crafts association, an umbrella body for all of the traditional crafts. Um, and we, we met halfway between us at the workshop of Mike Turner, who I'd heard about, who was the last sitting middle maker in the country. Um, Mike, at that stage, was 64. He was going to retire within the next year, and there looked to be very little prospect of him finding anyone to take the business on. Um, so it was a bit of a sad day in some ways, but we came away feeling really committed that, that we needed to do something about this situation. Um, Brian had actually been working um, at the time on the Crafts Blueprint alongside Patricia, which is um, and between the three of us, we then contacted various friends who, who we felt were influential in the crafts world um, and formed the first committee of the association. So having formed the association, we, we, decide, we had to decide what, what our remit was going to be, which crafts did we cover. Um, and we, we decided that the, the most important thing was hand skill and that, that um, rather than uh, Design, uh, designing and production being separated, we, we um, hand skill at the point of manufacture was, was crucial. Um, we, that, that includes various craft industries like the scissor making, where there's a lot of, or like um, saddle making in Warsaw, for instance, where there's a lot of skill at the point of manufacture. Um, the crafts we're interested in also mostly made useful objects rather than um, the sort of artistic, sculptural end of the craft spectrum is already very well looked at by the Crafts Council. So we're interested primarily in useful objects. Um, and many of these crafts are local or regional in nature, so cut through in Sheffield, swill baskets in the Lake District, um, saddle making in Warsaw, pottery in Stoke, shoes in Northampton. Um, many of our towns are actually where they are because of a craft industry. Um, that's often not realised. And probably most important of all is that heritage crafts are alive and developing. Um, now, probably one thing that people have questioned is why we chose to call ourselves heritage crafts, because the word heritage, as you've seen in the UK, has been linked with backward-looking museums, um, preserving things in aspect, and we're anything but that. The Heritage Crafts Association is totally forward-looking. We believe there's a future for these things. Um, uh, and crafts, traditional crafts have always developed new markets using the old skills, um, and that's what we're about. Um, so to share a little bit of our, our vision for where, where we had to go with the association, um, this is Trevor Abbott on the right with his pen knives, and John Henley, who's going to be joining us hopefully later in the day from The Guardian. 
Um, I took John to see Trevor and he did a, a write-up on his work. Um, and after that appeared 18 months ago, he had a, a run of orders um, and he still has a six months waiting list for his pen knives 18 months later. So we want to, oftentimes just a little bit of promotion can make all the difference to these things. We want to bring them out and, and show, people, um, show people what is going on out there. And there is tremendous demand from the public and, and, um, and a good response for these traditional crafts. Um, I guess also, I, if I was to have a, a big vision for where we're going, I like to think about what's happened over the last 20 years in, uh, in terms of local food production. Um, I used to, 20 years ago, uh, there was a book came out, uh, Henrietta Green's Food, Lover Gu Food Lover's Guide to Britain, which I used as a Bible and used to travel around finding little local cheese producers and fish makers and things. And back then, it was completely cranky, alternative, quite weird, frankly. And I feel that's about where we are with traditional crafts now. We're definitely alternative counterculture. Um, and over that 20 years, then, alternative, local, organic food production has become absolutely mainstream. It's on the telly all the time, celebrity chefs are using it. And I believe that's a sort of growth, that it, the growth potential that we have in traditional crafts. New research from the, the Valvend Whiskey, who are um, very interested in, in traditional crafts, um, show that 77% of people consider local crafts to be an important part of their heritage. This is a, a survey uh, of 2,000 randomly selected UK adults, um, not just rich middle class, middle class uh, people, it's a complete cross-section of the country. And 83% of those people were worried that some crafts might be lost in future if skills are not handed down to the next generation. So that shows that what we do, people care about. Now, we've been helped an awful lot um, in our, in, in, we've come a long way in the last two years and we've been helped a lot in that by high profile patrons, one of which is Sir Mark James, who is director of the b uh, another Alex Langlands, who's going to be talking to you later. Um, always people who are passionate about crafts, that's much more important to us than, than how high a public profile they have. Um, and I want to start the day now, really, by announcing um, that we have an even higher profile supporter who's going to be our new president. And these are a couple of quotes from our new president over the last couple of years. One says, um, I have a long had an admiration and respect for craftsmen of all kinds. It seems to me extraordinary that there hasn't been enough attention paid to the development of these living treasures. Um, and encouraging these crafts is something I care enormously about. So I'd like to finish by announcing the new president of Heritage Crafts Association is His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Now, those of you that work in cold, dusty, by the nature of the materials that you use, possibly dirty workshops, might think that there isn't a great link between what you do and a beautiful Savile Row bespoke suit. Well, there is a link, and it's an important link, and that link is craft. I was asking Mark what was his passion, and he told me that his passions were well-made things, simplicity, elegance and beauty, a good Benedictine influence, Joie de Vivre. I'm sure a lot of those passions help in the mentoring that he gives in the Crafted Scheme, which is a scheme that's been set up by Arts and Business to help 12 people a year grow their <coughs> businesses. And I have a feeling that the Arts and Business website where I looked a couple of weeks ago must have known that our theme was Craft and Passion, because this is what they say about Crafted, which is the scheme. Crafted is a mentoring program, passionate, about connecting the skills of those who have built successful businesses with those who have the potential to do so. Others of Mark's passions are beekeeping, though he describes himself as a not very successful beekeeper, but he is ace at Medla Jenny and Marmalade. <laughs> so over to you, Mark. 